project we have called the We Are Weather Project. Uh, it's been going on for a while. It's a bit of a collaboration between all sorts of different people in our hackerspace on the Gold Coast. Started because we saw a whole lot of weather stations all over the place. A lot of them are broken. Uh, they're proprietary. Sometimes you have data that it looks really awesome, like this one we have in our local library, if you can see there. Uh, no way to get the data at all. So we started on this little weather project. We wanted to make it super cheap. The idea is to make it so we could have them everywhere. So mass deployment of weather stations, really low cost. Went to Shenzhen, got a whole load of uh, these very basic parts you see on weather stations everywhere. This is a rain gauge. This is a, a, a radiation cage for a thermometer. Um, you see the little wind sensor there. We actually made that ourselves out of uh, <laughs> These are Christmas baubles from a Christmas tree. <laughs> a bit of uh, laser cut. This is from an ice cream container. Um, that worked quite well. Uh, we went through a whole lot of iterations. The iteration we have at the moment is uh, we have a Wi-Fi one, uh, which has now become entirely modular. It uses really cheap Shenzhen modules. And we have a, I've had it just running in the corner there throughout the day and measuring all that, how bad the air is in this room. I'll tell you, show you the data in a minute. Um, the project merged together with a whole lot of other things. We were building a Things Network LoRaWAN network at the time. Uh, we were also, I was working on an air quality project, so monitoring rooms like this in schools and meeting rooms, uh, just seeing how badly people were suffocating themselves with poor AC. So we brought the whole thing together. The weather stations now it does air quality, um, temperature, humidity, pressure, a um, whole lot of other data such as UV, uh, noise pollution from vehicles and dogs and all sorts of things like that. Um, the LoRa project, we abandoned our expensive LoRa gateways and actually went to a Raspberry Pi um, type shield using the Ryzen HF concentrator. And we run the Things Network on this, but we also run our own network, which is based off a project called LoRaWAN server, which is uh, written in Erlang by some guy who I think used to work with Ericsson. It's all in. Um, really awesome software actually and that hooks into Amazon Web Services but also to our own um, data, uh, time series database which is all here in InfluxDB. And we chart um, the LoRaWAN nodes, we've gone through a whole lot of different revisions of those as well, Origin originally using uh, Arduino and uh, um, AVRs, these little Hope RF um, uh, 96 chips which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, we've now actually moved to using the blue pills which is the same um, little board that Alistair talked about, because um, we've got a lot more um, programming space to play with, because if you do LoRaWAN on Arduino, about 98% of your flash will get used up by the NMIC library, which is a huge pain. It gives you like, you know, 2K to do any sensor <laughs> stuff. So, um, huge pain in the ass, so we're hoping to go with the STM. And um, this is the final revision of the Wi-Fi board, which I've got in the corner. Looks totally ugly but really cheap and really easy to get a lot of these sensors. We use the uh, BME uh, 280 from Bosch, uh, the uh, CCS 811 for measuring VOCs, carbon dioxide. Uh, that's the rain gauge, little sound sensor there. We have UV module, which isn't on there at the moment. We have uh, attachments for OLED screens and passive infrared and a few other things so they can be usefully used in home automation as well. And we push all the data for, to MQTT to InfluxDB through something called Telegraph, which is part of the Influx project. And the data at the moment is very raw, because the idea is we're going to now feed it to another group called um, the AI Academy, which is teaching AI and big data skills to all sorts of different people. We've got some government funding to bring the whole thing together from Queensland government. Um, but the raw data we push into Grafana, which is a project from the graph people that write Graphite. Uh, if anyone's used it here at all, it's really quick and easy to get going. The data's really messy at the moment here because I have a bit of a problem with the I2C bus and bits and pieces, but you can kind of see how hot it's been in this room. And uh, Since you guys opened the doors, it's got a lot better. Uh, CO2 level's on about 800 ppm. Uh, that's kind of, you're getting really tired. Getting to 1,000, you're like, ooh. Uh, 400 is really good for outdoors, 300, 400. Uh, VOC level's actually quite high for a normal room, like I think because I've got it really close to the carpet there, the carpet might be off-gassing a little bit, or we've got lots of electronics, and VOC is a very funny measurement, it's uh, made up of lots of different chemicals, and uh, but generally in the hackerspace our VOC level's quite low, and don't pay any attention to this graph, CCS811 is really shit at measuring temperature, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, if anyone wants to know more about this sensor, really, I haven't um, tuned this data yet, but you can actually feed back the temperature, humidity, 
values into the air sensors and get much better data. But this is raw data at the moment. So um, that's about it. If you're interested in the project, please come and have a talk to me. Um, it's a little big collaboration. So if there's anyone else who wants to take part, it's a nice little board, really cheap. It's going to be like probably 10 bucks or so for the maybe 20 bucks for the Wi-Fi one and the LoRa, the LoRa one. We want to get the whole thing sort of below about 200 bucks, including the gateway and the node, which gets us to our ulterior motive of getting LoRa gateways everywhere. So we kind of give these away to schools and libraries as part of our state government funding. And then once they actually have a LoRa gateway, then we can start adding lots of other things on there. But weather is a good one to lead with, because a lot of people like weather, so including me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, are we good? Yeah? Happiness? All right, I'm Arian. Um, I currently do quite a bit of stuff with with schools, mainly in Queensland, but all the way around Australia, we, we build resources. Now, working with schools, we're trying to find, well, we have actually been finding out what the actual issues on the ground are, and they're not what you might think. So we've been working with schools. I've done some soldering with, with for instance, year five kids, that's, that's 10 year olds. That works really well. But it only works well because I, or one of my colleagues, was actually in the classroom. As it turns out, the robots once built, they had a great time, they did year five maths, they did beautiful things with programming as well. Some, some worked into Python, the, the, the extended ones. However, those robots tend to not get used anymore after I leave. They're available, the kids actually know what they're doing, there's documentation available, there's support and so on, but it doesn't get used much. The reason is teachers are overloaded um, and they are not actually that tech skilled. What I'm asking you guys here is, if you're interested in helping out at your local school, you may have kids, um, or just helping out in the neighborhood, um, apart from things um, like the like Coda Jojo and other you know pr projects like that, um, the various coding coding projects at schools and, and libraries, think about ways that you might help both the teachers and the students work on fairly basic technology skills. Pick something apart. Um, teach them how computers actually work. And not a case of simply type and going into Python, but actually, why does a CPU do the way, it, you know, why does it work the way it does? Why doesn't, why doesn't it do many things at one time? All that kind of thing. It's actually fairly basic stuff. And if you can manage to get teachers more comfortable with technology, and that is not by tossing Python and Scratch and other things at them per se, um, things will actually improve in the land of digital tech. If you'd like some more ideas, which I obviously can't think of right now being put on the spot like this, um, please talk to me during the conference. There's an open education mini conference um, tomorrow all day, which you're also most welcome to, which we will be using to discuss some of these aspects. Because um, we're doing really, really cool stuff here, but this stuff, really, really doesn't work just like that in a school. That's not the way it works. It's not a matter of showing up with the cool gear. It doesn't happen that way. But stuff can be done, and obviously, you know, having teachers and, and kids be more tech capable is really good. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Josh. Uh, this is a project that I've spoken about in the past, um, and I'm just gonna give a, a little bit of a brief update on it. If I can get the screen up. Or not. Um, anyway, about five years ago, I started a project to do um, an open source engine management system um, based on slow hardware. Um, Josh, face that way. Face that way. Sorry, I was still looking at the screen. Um, uh, to, so that project has now matured a long way, um, and it's it's become to the point where I have a nice commercial product that I can get out the door for um, running an engine on. Um, it's matured from something that looked like that to something that looks like this. Um, and around the last 12 months worth of work on this, um, we've got to the point where there's about 130 different engines running on this system, um, from cars, bikes, go-karts, all sorts of things. Um, the firmware is now running about 18,000 lines of standard C. Uh, this is all running on an AVR 2560, so an Arduino Mega, for those who know that sort of platform. Um, in terms of milestones from the last year, it's run the first rotary engine, first five-cylinder engine, 
Um, it's now doing ethanol content sensing for fuel, uh, boost control, staged injection. Um, it has a standardized Bluetooth interface, so you can be tuning on a, uh, a tablet on your car instead of dragging your laptop in. Um, and a really fun exercise, the, the code base is now fully MISRA C compliant. And anyone who's done MISRA C work knows how much of a pain that is. Um, another big advantage on this now is that it's fully cross compilable onto ARM. The two architectures currently supported are STM32 uh, and the Kinesis K64 and K66 MCUs. So it's a single code base um, that just requires a recompile. Um, and it will upload onto those architectures using the same tune file and everything. You can literally just swap a board and you go from a 16 megahertz ECU to 120 megahertz. Um, that's a little adapter board I made for the, the Teensy 3.5 that to obviously take the form factor of a, a Arduino Mega and you can literally just plug that in and be off and running. Um, as far as um, some stress testing, this is a, just a quick video. Anyone who's done any engine timing know that you put a, a strobe light on the engine to measure the, the accuracy of the timing. Um, not sure how well this video is going to run. Um, but th this testing is showing a, an engine running at about 8500 RPM um, with, with ignition, ignition accuracy to about half a degree. Um, now this engine is also running about 30 pound of boost at the same time. And that little white dot there that's not moving is actually the, the crankshaft rotating at 8,500 RPM. Um, and so an error in that instance of around 100 microseconds would, would cause an engine failure. Um, so we, the, the timing accuracy of this is down to about 7 microseconds now. So that's just a, a little test of, of what the system can do. Um, but yeah, these are now in production um, and they're becoming quite popular in a lot of the, the DIY communities. Thank you.